think there's something momentous about the Rojava uh, project, the Rojava revolutionary project, because they're doing something that's very different to uh, you know, the politics, the radical politics that's gone on before. And I just want, uh, none of, neither of the speakers mentioned, um, one of the main influences on Urchalan, who was imprisoned at the time, on his change of political orientation from a kind of Maoist or marxist leninist politics was after the collapse of European uh, communism in uh, the period 89-91, um, Urchalan and many others around the world, including I'm sure many in this room, had to reassess their politics. And Urchalan, later on, when he was in jail, started to read the works by an American um, guy called Murray Butcher, who had been an anarchist, but who became a communalist. He called it uh, libertarian communalism. And uh, his works had, and ideas had a lot of influence uh, on Urgellan, and Urgellan's politics, which he uh, then fed through the PKK um, to the Rojava, what became the Rojava uh, Revolution. Um, Urgellan's politics, uh, that was one of the main influences, and he adapted it. He adapted it for Kurdish conditions and came out with his philosophy, an approach called. Uh, democratic confederalism. I just wanted to add that in there. Sure. Thank would you. Would you like to say something about it, Tony? Um, well, I, I guess not, not much to add to that. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly actually the ideology of uh, Chilean and the Kurdish movement is incredibly eclectic. So, I mean, it's originated a sort of Marxist style national liberation movement and yeah, I mean, Bookchin, I think the big thing they got from Bookchin was the idea of it to democratise a society, you start at the local level, and you know, but it's not a top-down process; it's a bottom-up process. And I mean, and I guess the main thing is, I mean, it is. I mean, I think it's very much where socialism is going in the 21st century. But I mean, in the 20th century, we were all sort of, you know, everyone was either a Trotskyist or a Maoist or a this or a that. And I mean, now. There's much more of an eclecticism going on, and, put, and looking at you know getting different ideas from different directions and putting it together and seeing what works in a particular place. I mean, certainly the other thing to be said though about Urchel and, and the philosophy of the Kurdish left is it's very, I mean, it's very much something that emerged in a particular region in having to deal with particular conditions and the fact that it emerged in a nation that's divided between four nation states with no nation state of its own meant that thing of looking beyond borders looking beyond nations and i mean it means simultaneously that on the one hand you know that's and this is true in turkey as it is in syria they're not talking about dismantling existing states they're talking about democratizing them so it's, they're not separatists, despite the fact that everyone calls them separatists. Um, but also, it's kind of like, I guess, it's a model that hopefully could make borders irrelevant. Thanks, uh, Tony and Noah, for your presentations. Um, I think this is a really important uh, topic, and not widely enough known out there in the, in the community, certainly in Australia. Uh, but I've got uh, two questions. First of all, first is, following on from the last one really, wh where are there examples of this, what you might call socialism of the 21st century model coming forward? And I have to say from my own experience and also from my political work that we have a very interesting comparison example in Venezuela today. Now I don't want to go into detail on that, but they, are, they have been developing under Chavez the idea of communal councils, communes, and the creation of, of um, socialist democracy from below. So I think it's interesting to think, are there other aspects in the world or places in the world where this kind of thinking is coming out of the, um, in, in a sense, from rejecting certain aspects of socialism of the 20th century, we have this concept of socialism of the 21st century coined by, by Chavez himself. That's one thing, that model. 
The second question relates to Australia. I think that how does this whole question of Kurdistan and the Kurdish question relate to Australia? I think we've got an incredible uh, hypocrisy going on in our government. No. About uh, well, just for change, just for change. On um, uh, they're all they're all very good on uh, refugee question and things like that. But um, uh, we have got laws, and I just wanted to mention what's happened today. There's a court case today of the Kurdish journalist. I don't know. Tony might like to say something about that. There's a Kurdish journalist in Australia being brought up before the courts on um, terrorism laws on the, under the terrorism laws now. This is really bizarre. We have the Kurdish um, forces in, in, in Syria, and maybe to a lesser extent in Iraq, that's a complicated question, fighting against ISIS. And we're supposed to be, and probably many people would argue, the most effective force against ISIS on the ground. And yet we're having people from, you know, have had some association with the Kurdish forces being charged under the terrorism laws. What the hell is going on here? I, I think the hypocrisy was even underlined even further when that dickhead from Queensland, Wyatt Roy, went over there. He's a former National Party MP. He's gone to Kurdistan. In fact, that's, that's probably a point in his favour now that he's an ex-MP, but he's not charged. He's not um, brought under any, um, you know, legal uh, sanctions, and yet uh, a Kurdish journalist and other people who are being associated with Rahava uh, are being brought. So I think that um, one of the important things that we need to bring out of this Rahava question is to campaign on the home front against the, you know, the use of these terrorism laws in a totally biased and hypocritical way against people who have. Uh, supported or, or been involved in support for the Rahava revolution? Um, I think there are numerous examples of uh, grassroots democratic uh, um, it, projects in many parts of the world. Many of them have, like in Rahova, are a result of necessity. Uh, we've seen in Spain, um, after the uh, austerity measures and the um, and the the brutal economic policies that follow uh, the GFC, um, uh, self-help communities. Uh, we've seen uh, collectivised uh, um, um, work um, uh, or, or um, attempts to create work. Um, and there's a, according to to some little bits and pieces I've read, there's almost a parallel economy in Spain now which uh, functions far more effectively for many people than the main economy. Uh, there's the anarchist commune in Athens. Uh, there are, I think, many examples. And one of the things that um, struck me when I was uh, reading Material Africa a couple of years ago is how many people in Africa, uh, in parts of Africa, are actually um, uh, outside of the formal economy and the formal political system and are remaking their... Uh, there's, uh, there's livelihoods in different ways. The black economy, as it's sometimes referred to as a pejorative way of referring to it, is actually for some people, and, and in some places large numbers of people, um, a far more important part of their lives in the formal economy. And it's this, I guess, um, exclusionary nation, nature of the, uh, the current economic system, which is for, forcing people to actually rethink how they survive, or what mechanisms they need to survive. And it's out of that that I think we're seeing some interesting uh, political and economic projects emerge. I mean, what happened in Rehova uh, was partly inspired by Ocalan and the PKK and um, um, the nationalist project. It's also largely come about out of necessity, forced into this uh, perilous state by uh, the Syrian conflict and um, the, the uh, dangers of ISIS, something quite remarkable has occurred. And I think we're seeing, if, if we look hard enough, uh, we can find examples of this in other parts of the world as well. Um, and I think that's something that we have to keep our eye on if we're trying to think about how the political, progressive political project in the 21st century will emerge. The only thing I'd say about Venezuela, it's one of the dangers of Venezuela, it is 
or not one of the dangers, but one of the things that we have to keep in mind is it still it follows, it's following a, and whilst it's um, both Chavez and Madura tried have tried to 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 sort of um, address some of the key problems of the centralised uh, 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 state of the 20th century, the, the sort of centralised economy and the top-down approach to um, economic development and poverty alleviation representation, the state is still the main instrument in Venezuela. And states in that mould are still oppressive inst instruments. Um, and there is an element of oppressiveness about the Venezuelan state that you know we sometimes uh, romanti ro romantically remove from the equation. Um, and that's something I think that Rahova, the Rahovan experiment is, is directly addressing. That nature of the oppressiveness that comes top down by trying to form participatory models that actually um, uh, work in, in the opposite direction. So that's why I think it's a far more exciting experiment than Venezuela, for me personally. Well, I'll start with Jim's second question. I mean, I'm glad you raised that, and I probably should have said something earlier in the talk. I mean, it was actually yeah, just today, Renas Lulakin, this Kurdish journalist, was in a bail hearing. He'll be back in court on Friday and find out whether he is going to be let out on bail. Currently, he's just been transferred from Silverwater to Goulburn's Supermax, and he's basically in solitary confinement. And I mean, he's a journalist, he's not a fighter, that's one thing. The other thing is, even if he was guilty of what we're accusing him of, which was fighting with PKK aligned forces, uh, People's Defence Forces, like, why are they terrorists? I mean, I mean, I think this is something we should be campaigning for in Australia, is to get the PKK off the list of terror groups and to get rid of terror laws altogether, because, I mean, frankly, they've always been about political repression and they're not necessary, I mean, because... It's never. It's always been illegal to kill people or blow things up or whatever. So it's not like there was actually ever a need to bring in any laws because of terrorism. It's also very much. I mean, you know, like if you're in Syria or Iraq, ISIS are a very real threat. In Australia, actually, ISIS is less of a threat than being struck by lightning. So I mean, it's. And I mean, when you look at things like the number of people who are killed in workplace accidents, and in Australia, the number of women killed in gender-based violence, which I think is about two a week, um, and then compare that with the number of people in Australia killed by terrorists, and it's like, well, this is actually a totally manufactured fear. They use the ISIS bogeyman very much has been used to, you know, bring in these laws. And, I mean, you know, ISIS with their, you know, sort of habit of making videos celebrating their own violence and all that, you know, sort of a very good you know, give a very good opportunity for governments to do that. But then, I mean, the fact that we're now seeing someone who's in Goldman Supermax accused of being in a group fighting against ISIS for democracy and equality, I mean, just shows how false all the justification of anti-terror laws are. And I mean, I think getting PKK off a terror list is important. In Jim's first question, yeah, I mean, I agree with it. I mean, there's definitely parallels between things happening in Rojava and things happening in Latin America, although I mean, in very different circumstances. So, I mean, there is many differences and similarities. Um, I guess in a world which is, you know, very much dominated by capitalist imperialism, and I mean, the nature of that is, you know, economic power backed up by military force, monopolization of resources. I mean, any revolutionary project is always going to be continually under threat. And I mean, we've seen this in Latin America, and I mean, it's also very, very much the case in Rojava, where, I mean, it's literally under siege. And I mean, that siege was fairly dramatic a few years ago when ISIS was surrounding Kobani. But I mean, it hasn't changed that much now, which is also something else I should mention, is also something we should be campaigning about here is to end the, that blockade and I mean obviously Turkey are a big part in imposing the blockade the other big one which is, and this is kind of, it might seem ironic, but the Kurdistan regional government in northern Iraq they've actually been very much involved in imposing the blockade on Rojava I guess one thing to draw out of that is, I mean often in shorthand and certainly the way the Western press talks, you know, talk about the Kurds and the Sunnis and the this and the that, but I mean that's actually not a very 
good way, I mean, it's not a very good way of explaining things. Um, I mean, it's like politics and ideologies and agendas and programs is what determines things more than people's ethnic or religious or whatever identity. And I mean, certainly in Iraqi Kurdistan, you've seen a very different sort of movement, which is nationalist, pro-Western, pro-capitalist. I mean, in a lot of ways, Iraqi Kurdistan has been the poster child for Western-style development in the Middle East, and I mean, it's definitely looks pretty good compared to the rest of Iraq, but um, it's still, I mean, you know, the development is very much based on, you know, foreign investment, lots of big projects, you know, big shopping malls and that sort of development, while there's also incredible disparity between rich and poor. On the social level, there's been an increase of a lot of sort of things which you, you know, are often associated with religious violence or um, you know, gender-based violence and that stuff has actually got worse under the KRG than it was before. So, I mean, it's like it's a sort of very modern capitalist type thing, but it's also where, you know, there's heaps of things like honor killings and all that so, sort of. So, I mean, it's a very different model from Rojava, but I guess where it's most strikingly different is the whole nationalism question. I mean, on the one hand, and I mean, this is something which obviously doesn't help the cause of the uh, Rojava forces, because, I mean, there's a real fear amongst Arabs in Syria, particularly those who were descended from people who were transmigrated in under the Arabization projects, which now refer to in the 70s, 60s and 70s, where the Syrian governments tried to change the population by moving in Arab migrants. The same thing happened in Iraq. But then when the KRG came to power, they then ethnically cleansing the Arabs, or this is our country, not yours, and then the Turkmen and various other non-Kurdish minorities have all been, like, suffered varying degrees of either persecution, discrimination, or been driven out. Whereas in Rojava, by contrast, yeah, there's very much it's yeah very much ethnic inclusivity and you know an urchin has written about the fact of not wanting to create a new kurdish nation state where kurds oppress others and i mean i think some of urchin's development was based on looking at what was happening in iraqi kurdistan and like no that's not what we want and but i mean it's also ironic that with this nationalism which is you know bad news for people of non-kurdish ethnicities in iraqi kurdistan but at the same time the regime there has been very well i mean it's close friends with the erdogan regime in turkey it's close friends with the iranian regime i mean it's quite happy to be close to a lot of regimes which are very yeah who've been very brutal against kurdish people so i mean it's a sort of twin sides of nationalism uh, one country which hasn't been mentioned tonight is Iran, and two pertinent points, uh, first of all, uh, being an ally of uh, Syria and uh, with the regime there, and uh, secondly, that uh, Iran also has a history of uh, repressing its uh, Kurdish population and certainly doesn't want uh, any kind of uh, t uh, Kurdish independence movements which might then encourage Kurdish people in their own country. Uh, so my question is, well, two phase, just to um, some comments on the other position, current position, and uh, recent sort of going back uh, over the last couple of years of Iran in this, and uh, the prognosis for how you see the uh, Iran in relation to this. I agree exactly. I mean, Iran and Turkey share common interest in not seeing a successful Rahovan Kurdish uh, project. Um, but at the moment, their priority is the propping up and the, and the continual survival of the Assad regime. Um, and I think first and foremost, protecting Damascus, protecting um, Assad comes before these other issues. As you know, I think we've, I think both Tony and I agree that for the moment, Rehova survives the threats or is less threatened than it might be if either Assad falls or ISIS is completely eliminated. Because then the US and, um, and in particular, but also um, Turkey and other states who have interests in the, uh, the region will then no longer need the, uh, the, the Rehovans, who effectively I think have been, uh, for, a, for a number of the states, my enemy's enemy 
Um, and that's the only reason that they've um, been given any support and protected somewhat um, in recent years. If Assad survives, then there's every likelihood that he survives and actually eliminates threats and re-establishes his control of the country. I have little doubt that he will look to militarily um, uh, enforce his rule over Rehova once again. So at the moment, the um, com com complicated and brutal situation is actually working in the, the favour of the Rovans, which is a terrible thing to say, but um, um, that's how it seems to me at the moment. I was reading in uh, New Republic magazine reported one fighter who was fighting with the Women's Protection Unit, or Harbin Unit, a Kurdish woman. She, she, she explained why she supported the Rahavan Revolution. Quote, women have been suppressed for more than 50,000 years and now have the possibility, we now have the possibility of having our own will, our own power, and our own personality. How does that link in with the ideology practiced by the Rahavan people of a democratic confederation, an ethnically inclusive and bottom-up democratic system, democracy without a state, anti-hierarchical, egalitarian, anti-authoritarian, and as a model which, which is the opposite of the neoliberalist model of the West, which is authoritarian and very unequal, does that explain the contradiction between the stated United States support for the Kurds and its United States blind eye to Turkey's and its own IS complicity? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I've said to those last questions very much, yes. And I mean, but with, with the US, it's actually a, quite a, strange contradiction at times, because I mean anyone who's had, you know, a glance at how the world works and what the role of the US in it kind of knows that the US is motivated by, you know, dominating the economy, keeping economic rivals out of oil rich areas, etc, etc, but they don't say that. But moreover, since the end of the Cold War, like communism's no longer the big enemy, and you know, Islamism has become the big you know, the big new sort of enemy and propaganda. So, I mean, it's sort of like this is where Rajab was actually sort of giving the West a bit of a dilemma, because, I mean, it's like, yeah, they don't want to see something like that succeed, but they can't really say that. I mean, especially when they've spent most of the last 15 years invading the Middle East, allegedly to bring democracy and empower women and all the rest of it. But, I mean, I guess it just shows, in a way, also how, I mean, what's happening in Rajab also just shows how much bullshit that idea is. I mean, firstly, I mean, you know, yeah, the West should invade the Middle East to empower women because the West is just so totally free of sexism. I mean, it's kind of, on that level, it's a bit ridiculous. Whereas, I mean, that quote from the YPJ fighter has said exactly what it is about. It's about, you know, I mean, women's liberation comes from women rising up. That's, it doesn't come from, you know, drones and stealth bombers. I mean, that's, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think for the US it very much is a contradiction, but I mean, they can't say that they don't like, you know, equality and all the rest of it, but they don't. Um, and I guess, yeah, in terms of the ideology, like, I mean, the, the centrality of uh, women's liberation in it is just one of those things which just jumps out every time you look at it, and it's like, you know, I mean, it's like leftists can have different views on how important feminism is to a revolution or whatever, but I mean in Rojava it just is, like it's a feminist revolution and if you didn't want it to be it still would be, like I mean that's just what's happening there and I mean it really is quite striking and those sort of sentiments you get amongst the fighters, it's like, it's, I mean it's sort of often you see it on a very human level what revolution means, that you know people who are actually taking control of their own destiny isn't actually you know, fighting for their own liberation, but also it's not it's not individualist in, in the sense of you know fighting for liberation of society. Um, and you know they talk a lot in the stuff about changing mentalities as well, and they have you know things like I mean, and it's obviously a real thing. I mean, in some ways, like having the women's militia and all that is the easy part. How do you actually change you know fifty thousand years of you know, mindset, how do you actually, you know, and if, you know, things like the family system and all that are very, very entrenched. Like, so, I mean, it's obviously, it's something which is in a way only just beginning, but it's pretty amazing. And I think, it, yeah, it's also something it should show us as well, is that, 
I mean, I think sometimes even on the left we can subconsciously fold into this idea that somehow, you know, we in the West are the ones who are going to be more, you know, have more sort of liberated ideas and all that. But I mean, the most advanced feminism in the world at the moment is coming from the Middle East. For one very small part of the Middle East, I just add. And I agree, yes, and I don't have anything to add. I think we should wind up. Uh, we should definitely thank Tony for uh, joining us at the last minute and providing such an insightful and educative um, ex um, um, uh, uh, explanation of what's happening in Rehoboth. Uh, thank you all for turning up.